Good morning. Good morning. So, by raise of hands, who here has used an outdoor faucet? This is not a trick question. This is, you know, the outdoor spigot outside of your house? Okay, cool, generally, everyone. If you don't know, don't be embarrassed. Google it, talk to the person next to you. They raise their hand, so they're either lying or they know. So, outdoor faucets. These things are amazing. They, they, you can attach hoses, you know, sprinklers, fill water balloons, you know, wash sand off feet, emergency uh, drinking fountain for toddlers, not that I would know. They, they, they're just, they're amazing. And there's an unlikely beauty to those little guys because they're not the source of the water. That is, you know, the, the water doesn't begin with them. Instead, they, they are simply a conduit for that water to go from the inside and spread it to the outside. They're, they're not in charge of where the water goes, where, where it nourishes, what it nourishes, how it's received or used. Their sole purpose, the, the water faucet's sole purpose, is to let the water out on the will and whim of the owner. We are the same way. To, to put it simply, we are water faucets. Because <laughs> we're, we're not the source of the water of life. In other words, we're not, the, we're not the source of life and sustenance. We are the conduit. We take what is inside the house of God and spread it to the outside. Similarly, we're, we're not in charge of how God chooses to distribute that water, uh, you know, that, that love. Nor do we get to decide how it's used, how it's received, or who or what it nourishes, or how. Our sole purpose is to let what is on the inside pour out on the will and whim of our king, our cornerstone. Last week, I don't know if you're here, if not, no worries at all. Last week, we talked about recognizing Jesus as our cornerstone, and we figured out how to do that by assessing the various things in our lives and asking a dangerous question. Is God at the center of this? It, it all begins with submitting to Jesus, our King, and trusting that when we build on Him, that, that the things that matter in our lives, they finally will start to last beyond our abilities to control or pull through. So this, this theme of cornerstone continues in, this, in the second part of Matthew 22 that we're going to study today. And so I, I really want to double down on what it looks like to live out this submission to Jesus. So in, in broader strokes, how do we become who and what we're meant to be? Again, if he is the cornerstone, and cornerstone is, is a building term, then if we're building, what are we building today? We're going to unravel that. And as is true with pretty much all of God's kingdom, the, the answer is simple, not easy. So, who and what are we meant to be? To answer this, Let's look at the story that we just read together, and then I'm going to make a few observations about it that will kind of be the, the foundation of our answer to that question. Who and what are we meant to be? So, Matthew 22, 34 through 40, if you'll read with me. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together again to question him. One of them an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. The, this is the first and greatest commandment a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. 
Okay. So Jesus just answered probably the most loaded question ever. What is the most important thing we should do to abide by God, to abide by God's laws? In in our modern culture and age, we might phrase that same sort of loaded question like, what's the meaning of life? What's our purpose here? And, And Jesus's answer is incredibly profound. So for those of you who have grown up in the church and for those of you who following Jesus is a new thing, Let's not rush past this. It's easy to read this, be like, oh yeah, you know, that makes sense, and then to just keep moving on. So let's not. Don't rush past this because Jesus didn't give us a parable, you know, or, or a mystic riddle, or he didn't even answer the question with a question. Again, all behaviors we, we've seen him do. So here, he gives us a clear, concise answer. Love God. Love him with everything you have, everything you got. Love him with your time, your money, your studies, your playtime, your attention, your love, your body, everything. Love him with everything. I remember reading this when I was a new Christian and, you know, kind of stopping, pausing me like, wow, yeah, you know, love him with everything that I got. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Where, what's the most important thing that we can do with our lives? Love God? Okay, yeah, yeah. No huge logical leaps there. Where should we drive our meaning and purpose? Jesus? Okay. <laughs> but he didn't stop there. Jesus kept going. He says, the second is equally important. So Jesus just put on equal footing the command to love God with everything that we are and do. And so what was that second command? Love others with the same intensity and care and attentiveness that you show yourself. Now, he did say that this one is second, so I want to be clear. There is a certain sequence to these, you know, an order that we should do them. And and yet... He makes it crystal clear that they are equally important. And how do we know this? Because he literally says, these are equally important. So, what do we do with this? I mean, how does this help us answer that question about who and what we are? What are we building? So, I'm going to take you on a bit of a tangent, but I promise it's going to, you know, going to tie in. Scout's honor. I was never a scout, so don't hold me to that. So there's a, there's a law in the field of medicine called Wolf's Law. Wolf with an E at the end, in case you're curious. And it states that form follows function. Applied, it means that in nature, in reality, everything, sorry, it, in reality, if you know something's form, you can derive its function. And that's, that's the beauty of our creator. He put purpose into everything that he made. So every cell, think about it for a second, every cell in existence follows this law. Form follows function. And it's not just the stuff that we can't you know, observe with the naked eye. It's, it's plants and animals and even the cosmos all follow this one principle. Form follows function. But wait, there's more. (laughs) It's amazing because it goes the other way too. If we know a list of functions, we can actually derive what the form should take. Therefore, because Jesus just summed up the entirety of God's will and purpose for us into two incredibly simple, again, not easy, but simple functions, we can derive our form. So again, we we are called to love God with everything that we are, to love everyone around us with the same care and attention that we show ourselves. Two functions. So, what should our form be? Well, to, to love God with everything means that we make him the cornerstone, the, the foundation of all that we hold dear. 
Like we, like we talked about last week, that's everything from our habits, our jobs, our schoolwork and homework, our extracurricular activities, our passions, our desires, our needs, our relationships. He, he meant everything. So if we ask Jesus to become the center of all of those things and to submit to him as he actually does what we're asking him to do, to be the center, we can begin to love him with all that we are. Then there's the second part, the, the loving other people as ourselves. I've often heard it said that we first need to love ourselves first, learn to love ourselves first before we can be effective at loving other people. And very respectfully, I don't think that that's what Jesus is getting at here. Jesus isn't telling us to get right with ourselves, to just focus inwardly before we can become effective at loving other people. And you might be thinking, you don't really know how to love others with that degree of care and attention. But here's the thing. You do. You just might not be able to recognize or, or recognize what God is really asking for you to do here. God isn't asking to immediately and without reservation love everyone and treat everyone with a, with a sacrificial love consistent with that of, you know, an intimate marriage or the, you know, absolute 100% love that you show yourself. No, he isn't asking us to burn out as we try to fulfill every possible need for everyone all the time around us. That would, that would be ridiculous and unhealthy. So we know that that can't be what he's saying here. So what is he asking of us, truly? Feed others. Clothe them. Invite them in where it's warm. I'm not, don't just make this abstract. Don't make this an intellectual exercise. Literally feed them. Give them food. Clothe them. Invite them in where it's warm. Give freely and without reservation. Talk with them. Show them the time of day. Don't neglect them. Check in with them regularly and don't take I'm good as a satisfactory answer, you know? Here's the crazy part. When we begin to do this, when we start to learn how to love other people, we actually start to learn how to love ourselves better too. We start to see that we're not alone, that we can't take care of ourselves in isolation, nor should we, because we were designed for community. And when a group of people really start to love each other like this, acting out this commandment, the weight of the world slowly starts to fade away. We were designed for community. God knows this. That's why he was calling us to love one another rather than just focus on ourselves all the time. And it's only when we get out of our heads and focus on the very real people around us that we finally start to improve on the way that we love ourselves. It's just like the water faucet guys. If, if the water in the analogy is the, the healing, restoring, life-giving love of our God, then the faucet that is us, the faucet is only covered, only submerged completely by that love, by that water, when it's open. If it's closed, the water can only go part of the way through the spigot. Worse, the plant's and the ground suffer when the spigot refuses to open up. And the faucet itself will dry up if it never lets the water out. And it's only when it's open that it receives the fullness of that water, of that love as well. Our king, he knows this. That's why in an effort to love us well, he calls us to look beyond ourselves and behave in the way that he demonstrated, the way that he loved others like himself. Now, I want to make a few just very broad stroke 
observations of how Jesus did that. Jesus didn't let people just walk all over him. He, he was not timid or passive. He was not even negligent of his own needs. Like, he, he took alone time. He took naps. Like, a lot of naps. He did nature walks. Like, he took care of himself. And so, we can observe in the way that he lived that he wasn't reliant on his own abilities. Instead, he allowed God's love, his Father's love, to pour through it. And you might be thinking, sure, but he was Jesus. And yet, he said again and again and again that he was sent by the Father, that it was the Father's will, the Father's power, the Father's love that he lived out. We get to be the exact same. The call to love others is not reliant on your ability to pull it off. Instead, it's his will and power. To go back to the faucet analogy, it's his water, right? We're just here to help it spread. So let's get back to that question that we asked at the very beginning. Who and what are we meant to be? Well, the answer is we are catalysts for God's kingdom. Put, put in other words, we are the way God has chosen to spread his love. And the more we tap into that identity, the, the, the lifestyle of submitting to him and letting him into every aspect of our lives, the greater our capacity will be to love others well and ourselves. To, to finish with that water faucet analogy, when we learn to love God with all that we are, we actually increase the size of the spigot's opening. That means that when we eventually pour out God's love, the more of ourselves gets covered and more of God's love can spread too. It's, it's the ultimate win-win. You get to be closer to the father and king who went bankrupt to buy you back and the world gets changed by his transformative love. There's literally no downsides. And, thanks. and while I do mean this on, on a global scale, it is ultimately expressed in the people around you. And that's why this matters so much. Why we can't just put this off. If we keep our you know, metaphorical faucets closed, we suffer and our families and our coworkers, and our fellow students, and our jobs suffer as well. And so, I challenge you. I, I don't want this, again, to just be an intellectual exercise. I challenge you to think of one category, one thing in each category that you can push towards. For, for loving God, what's one thing? Think of it right now. I, I'm, not, I'm not joking. I mean, you can, this is ultimately your relationship with God, so I have no authority for you to force you to do this, but I encourage you, I implore you, think of one thing right now, one area that you can submit to him. Make him the center of. And for loving others like yourself, is there one person in your life that you can show this care to? Again, it's, it's not the overwhelming weight of taking care of every single one of their needs. It's clothes, it's food, it's just attention, showing them that you see them it could be a hug, a prayer, maybe all of the above. Because, my friends, there's no middle ground here. This command from our king is absolute. There's also no room for argument because Jesus clearly states that these two things are the most important ones that we could possibly do. Jesus says that all of Scripture and God's intent to restore all things can be summed up in these two commands, love God, love others. That's it. So find those parts, find those people that you can so start to submit to God's love. And you will see the change. It's going to be subtle at first. The, the proverbial water 
that's flowing through you might just start as a trickle. That's okay. But as you give more of yourself to God, that water pressure is going to grow. And our world, and again, let's make it tangible, let's make it real, our community here at Village Church, our families, our friends, we need you. We do. And you won't be excluded by that love pouring through you either. You will be changed into who you were meant to be. So let's, let's go be water faucets together. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. King Jesus, we recognize the, the weight, the importance that you placed on these two commandments these two mandates for following you, for serving you. To love you, God, everything that we are, and to love others like ourselves. But Jesus, actually implementing that is not a, a natural thing for us. It's not, our, it's not our default setting. And so will you, with your grace and your mercy and your courage, Will you help us slowly transition into this lifestyle that you're calling us to? Will you help us submit to the things that you are not central of and give them to you? And Holy Spirit, will you give us, again, the the courage to love other people in these tangible, real ways, the people in our lives that need us? Will you help us, even if it's just a little trickle right now? Will you grow us and transform us into the people we were meant to be? We love you. Please help us. It's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen.